our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. You, so you have your books, so I'll look at the table. Huh? Is I in the way? Yeah. That's what we'll look at. Next picture. What we'll do is we'll start weaving in and out of this book. Well, remember the book? Yeah. The book is a springboard for us. And so, you know, what I encourage you to do is read the whole thing. And always be read right ahead of where we have to, because you're not going to read the book. So, um... The book is ever going to be posted somewhere so not everybody can buy it? No, I mean, in October was the last 12, I think, that I found in any kind of new condition of existence. Um, you know, we tried to locate them before. But like I said, it's not going to be exclusive. I mean, we, we, the book's the basis. It'll give us a structure. That's why I said, we're going to look at the table of contents first, and then you'll see how it's laid out on the question. So, Father Salim, the next edition will be completely different from this book. It's not just simply go through and fix typos. The next one coming out, whenever it comes out, he's still working on it, is going to be set up according to the liturgical year. So he's going to do more of a structure in that way. I don't know exactly. He's explained it briefly to me, but it's along those lines. But I like the way this one's broken down anyways. And as you can see, it's not a catechism book. What it is is things that are specifically of the Maronite faith, the, specific, the specificity of it. And part of the problem is, is when we don't know what that Syriac expression of the Catholic faith is, then we just simply go off and become Latins. Because that's what we're surrounded by, and so we start doing those things. There's nothing wrong with them, but it's not our tradition. You know? Our tradition are veils over sanctuaries, tons of incense, the hidden God, the great mystery, all of that aspect to it. And so, you know, that's more in accordance. Right now, I'm actually trying to compile prayers from out of, the, out of our divine office of Safro and Ramsha, because I want to do a compilation to make a Maronite prayer book, and, and do a Maronite version of the acts of faith, hope, and charity, for example, to, to, to develop some of the basic prayers that we do, a Maronite morning offering, and not just simply the League of the Sacred Heart of the Jesuits used in the morning for your, your morning offering. Though most people don't even do a morning offering anymore. But in the classic form of spirituality, when we have these prayers and the structure on a daily basis, you know, we have that morning offering, right? So with this kind of basis, but I, I, to give them a bit of a spin. So in the background, I'm working on that and filling out them, typing them up and doing an outline. Yes? Uh, what about a uh, Maronite hymnal? Well, in theory, that exists on the website already. We have those hymns. They've been working very much in the English-speaking world in the last, especially the last 15 years. Any, so those are there. Any thought of putting it into a book form? You can print it off of the website. Yeah, well, I know, what you, yeah I know what you're saying. I don't know that anyone's working on that right now. If they would, it would probably be done out of the seminary. That's where a lot of the eparchial work was being done. Because when Father Abdullah, when Father Jeffrey was there, um, he was the musician behind all of it. That's why if you look, a lot of the melodies you'll find on the website, some of the melodies are, are actually just from him. But some of those he's just adopted from the local Latins. That's why I have no problem introducing you to Gregorian melody. And that's why on Ash Monday we did. That's the Gregorian second mode 2D. So. One of my favorites, easy to sing, and melancholic enough to fit a lot of our context, liturgically. So, all right. So, what you'll see in the, in the table of contents is pretty straightforward on the question of the faith 
And he, what he does here is he's pointing out the different aspects for an Eastern slash specifically Maronite understanding of these different aspects. The emphasis upon the light of the faith, you see in the beginning. The, what is the object? What is the actual thing that we are directed towards? So you notice in chapter 2, it's the fathomless mystery of the Trinity, the notion of the hidden one. We think we know God, and to the degree that we think that we know God, we are totally wrong, and we are, you know, we are mistaken. And so, and especially you'll see in chapter 3, the great Syriac tradition is that everything is focused upon our Lord. Well, the Byzantines, it's all the hidden Trinity. It's all emphasis upon the Trinity, really. I mean, our Lord is obviously central. But for the Syriacs, the concreteness of the fact that this is God manifest, Jesus Christ. That's why the Kadisha, the Trisagion, it's directed to our Lord. It is not, because a lot of times whenever there's threes, you go, oh, it's the Holy Trinity. It's like, no, the Trisagio, this Kantishat is sung, it is directed to our Lord. Which is why whenever we expand it by any other consideration of prayer, it's always done about our Lord. You who were crucified for us. You who were baptized by John. You who were born of the daughter of Mary. And that's something very distinctly Syriac. You know, and something which I always found very profoundly beautiful, which is why... I became Marianne, because I think these things and these specificities are the things that we have to always have at the forefront of our mind to be able to explain this faith to others. Because people will ask you, what's a Marianne? You know, for the last 80 years we said, well, we're Lebanese. And it's like, that's not the definition of, Lebanite, uh, of the Marianne faith. And as I told you before, I know enough Syrians who get quite upset with that. They are Maronites, but they're not Lebanese. And that they are Maronites from, you know, Aleppo is a very ancient church of Maronite. Never has been, never will be Lebanese, but it will always be Aleppo. Right? And so it's interesting, it's one of these interesting details. Because we were talking about just before the class began, the future of this church depends upon the apostolic endeavor of conversions. Not picking off Latin Catholics, but conversions, bringing the Gospels to everyone. You know, there are thousands of people in Waterville alone who have no clue of who Jesus is or the Gospel or anything. We know that. You work with them. And so the fact is, is that we who hold this treasure have to be able to communicate and desire to communicate it with others. We're not in a day, and I don't think we ever were in a day, when someone who's questioning about these different topics is ever going to show up at the rectory and knock on the door and say, Hi, can I just ask you some questions? No. They're going to ask the person that they're in class with. They're going to ask the person they're at work with. Maybe at some point they'll have a contact with the actual institution, if you want. But the contact is person to person. Right? It's one of the reasons why we wrote the long reflections in the bulletin last week on individualism. The problem is, is we're being locked into our own little egos, and that locking in makes us more and more paralyzed to even communicate to anyone outside us in anything more than just superficiality. And when we do communicate, we can't, and it becomes this kind of hysterical rant where the other person is my enemy. And so it's one of the reasons why we're doing this class on the Wednesdays is the important aspect for us to keep going deeper and deeper. So we've done a lot of history. We still have more history to do because we haven't gotten to the age of, of St. Mary himself yet. So we will weave in and out on these different things. So that's just an example on that first section of part one. You'll also notice in chapter six there the great emphasis on koinonia. The idea of communion, that churches are intercommunions making up the one single body of Christ. The Latin church, of course, is very Roman. And the idea there's a pope on the top, and then there's an administration, and it's a great pyramid coming down. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's just the Latin vision of the churches. The Eastern churches have never had that vision. <laughs> never. And so they will govern. The churches themselves are under patriarchs and bishops, and they govern. They govern intercommunion with them. Right? 
The Pope is the central patriarch and infallible by his office as the successor of Peter, but is not, and this is one of the, we're living through this historical moment when Rome is consciously trying to disengage from things which are too imperial. John Paul II did it when he talked about the Pope as being the heart or the center of the church rather than the head in some kind of pyramidal form. That's what a lot of the Easterners, and especially the Orthodox, reject is the idea of this is the supreme administrator who can, when he wants, if he wishes, intervene in your local church. Now, in practical, in practical questions of administration, that, that, that is certainly part of the doctrine. But seeing it as a central part, or as I explained to one of the Orthodox recently, as seeing it as being the court of appeal. No one thinks of the, for example, if we take the American system, no one thinks of the Supreme Court as someone who is going to personally intervene in the courts of Maine, for example. But when they make a decision, it affects them. But they don't directly come in and tell a judge, you must do this or do that or change your circuit or whatever. So, that's an example. So those are one of the things that we'll come back to in chapter 6. And then, of course, in chapter 8, on the specific aspect of the Mar Maronite and Syria. On part two, you have the question of melto, melto aloho, the word of God. So this communication given to us. And the great emphasis on that personal engagement that we have, that has to become lifelong. You know, faith is not just simply the um, ascribing to a set of doctrines. It is clearly the engagement, and that's in this week's bulletin, we talk about that a bit. Making a distinction, you know, to understand that faith, charity, this personal engagement, you must follow me. You must take up your cross. You, anyone who loves father, mother, brother, sister more than me is unworthy of me. These are really scathing statements if you take them just on a human level. But when we understand the necessity of that turning toward God, then it's understandable. It's the response to this word. Because we all know people who are baptized Catholics who have no religion in them whatsoever. They don't believe anything. They have kind of a, they have a memory of going to catechism class when they were little. And they have certain kind of cultural ideas about Christianity. But they're not engaged personally with our Lord. They do not have the theological faith. They do not actually believe. And, you know... Steve and I have talked about this before, because you see so often in our prayers the idea of proximity and farther. And of course, the farther you are, the farther you become. Because if you ignore your friend for years, you can't hardly call that a friendship. And then after a lifetime of ignoring this person, you expect to show up at the end of your life saying, okay, now take me in. Now, we haven't even communicated in 60 years. What are you talking about? On a human level, we understand that to be absurd. And yet, people live in this kind of fairy tale land where they think that all of a sudden, at the moment of death, all of a sudden, the gates of the divine kingdom open up to them. So when they have ignored this person for their entire adult life. And so you see the absurdity. You see a whole section on this idea of the engagement of the person with the word of God. Right? And notice that I'm putting it in this terminology that it's not a Protestant understanding of the word of God in just scriptures. I'm talking about the engagement of the revelation which is given to us, of which part of it is scripture. But the word of God is much larger than just the written word of scripture. That's also, we'll see in that whole section. All right. And that's why you'll see 9 and 10, the scriptures, holy tradition, the liturgical year. God speaks to us entirely during the whole liturgical year. I mentioned the other morning at Mass in St. Jude's. There are graces being given to us during the season of the great fast that are not given to us at other times of the year. There are graces given to us at the time of the nativity that are not given to us at other times of the year. There are graces being given to us in the season of the announcements that are not given to us during the glorious nativity. And when we think about the season of announcement, we're totally distracted by celebrating the nativity before the nativity and just being distracted by stuff and organization and parties and everything else. We're not even listening to what the graces of that season specifically of the word 
It's called the announcements. These communications to Zachary, to the mother of God, to this communication continually moving closer and closer and closer to the glorious nativity. So part three, then God's kingdom. It's that response which allows God to establish this place of grace and healing, which we call the kingdom. And so that great importance, and that's why in chapter 13, we have Mary, the mother of God, because she is the paradigm. She is the exemplar of responding to the word of God in perfect fidelity at every instant of her existence. That's why we speak about her impeccability. She never sinned. It's not to extol her. It's to say, when we say that she's impeccable, it's not to make her a different being. It just means after Adam and Eve screw it up, she is the only human being who has shown this exemplar as a model of the response to God's illumination, to God's word, to God's communication to us. And it's a very beautiful aspect. We see that in Cana last Sunday. Do whatever he tells you. The communication that takes place between the two of them, calling her woman. And so that whole section in um, part three. And notice the way that Father uses the term, God's kingdom, the already and the not yet. And that's the confusion when we speak about the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of God, sometimes it sounds like we're talking about the vision of the hidden one, you know, the eternity. At other times, it sounds like the institution, you know. I give you the key power of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's pretty much, you know, here. And yet, we always speak about this. And then, or, or, or St. John the Baptist talking about the kingdom as being judgment. You know, God is laying axe to the root, and the winnowing fan has been brought to the floor, all right, to winnow. And so this, this uh, judgment. And so he has chapter 14 on human destiny. And then, of course, once we understand that, well, then how do we live this reality of the kingdom? Well, that's all of part four in the divine mysteries. What are the mysteries? The mysteries are our life within that kingdom. And hence, it goes back to that original idea. The farther we are away, uh, we are away the farther we are away. Not just simply are not at the personal level. Now we have just simply, by stepping away, suffocate ourselves and never nourish ourselves, never receive any of this grace, not participate in the mysteries. And this is the profound, profound, profound difference between Catholicism and Protestantism. Protestantism is empty. There are no mysteries. There is no divine presence. The closest you come to it is the Word of God, which is then communicated as an expression of an academic study, not as a continuity of tradition, because they can't even agree on what the tradition is. It's just simply, we, we believe in the Word of God, we respect the Word of God, we talk about it, and then we sing some things, and then we go home. That is not the divine mysteries. That is not the divine presence of Kadisha, of bowing before the substantial presence of the Messiah in front of us. The scriptures are a manifestation of God. They are a manifestation of the Messiah to some extent, but they are not the substantial divine presence. All right? So that is a very, it's a very profound idea. And I always come back to it because we live in a Protestant country at best. And we are completely in a non-liturgical, non-mystery mentality when it comes to going to church. So I, you will never hear me use the term going to church. You don't go to church. You are a member of church. You are the church. You go to the divine mysteries because there the body is vitalized by the divine presence. A totally different idea. And the notion of sacred space and sacred place. The only ones who retain this idea in Christianity are the Catholics and the Orthodox. And the tragedy now is that when Protestants begin to understand they're living in this very deficient mode of Christianity, and they discover the sacraments, they discover the mysteries, they become Orthodox. Because apparently none of their Catholic colleagues that they're at work with can explain anything to them, but the Orthodox can. Now we have Jesus. We have the divine temple where God reigns supreme. The place where you spend two hours bowing and singing, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. 
That's why even though the directions that you were holding in your hand on Ash Monday said you sing three times Kyrie Eleison, I thought, oh, what the heck, I'm not done yet. So we'll just keep singing Kyrie Eleison. And it was beautiful, because that's what we're doing here anyways. Why are we blessing this dirt? Is because of the fact that we're seeking God's mercy. Right? You know, but if you've ever been to the Ukrainian church or something, and one of the other Byzantine rites, they'll just they also keep singing, you know, Lord have mercy, until the deacon kind of goes, okay, next part. And he sings out over the top of them, shouting out the next thing we're going to. Right? So, that's why this whole next section on the sacraments, on the divine mysteries, and notice how it's linked together. Our moral life flows from the mysteries. If you don't participate in the mysteries, you cannot live what the church understands to be the Christian life. And that I often come back to is the Christian life is not just pay your bills and stop at red lights. Everyone can do that if they've been well educated. But to live a life which is radically transformed because there is a divine illumination which in your spirit. So we're working on reprinting a book. Um, there's a former student of mine, he's doing, he's doing a a ten-volume series of all of these articles that were written between the mid-1940s and the mid-1950s in a journal called Integrity. And it was a journal written by lay people who were really wrestling with the profound Catholic ideas in the middle of the 20th century because they saw in the 1940s that things were already going quite screwy. So they published this journal, and there are some absolutely exquisite and brilliant articles in it. And so I'm reading through the first volume because a student of mine asked me to do a preface, do a foreword for the, the first volume of what's going to be ten books. But integrity was that, and, and that is the lay apostolate. Catholic lay people wrestling. What does it mean to be a welder in the 20th century as a Catholic? What does it mean to be an accountant in the 20th century as a Catholic? Not just being an accountant who happens to be a Catholic. But what is the Catholic vision on economics? How, what is the value of money? Where does this idea of our Lord's teaching? You cannot serve God and mammon. That's the Catholic way of thinking. And we cannot have that Catholic morality, because morality just means actions. Most moris in Latin, most. Moralis is an adjective, meaning something referring to our actions. That's what morals means. It just refers to actions. You go with bad morals and you have good morals because their actions may be good or bad. And the beauty of it is, is that that idea, and so in this one article I'm reading, the article that I'm reading now is, is called The Frustration of the Incarnation. And she mentions, and her name's Carol Robinson, and I met her just before she died in the 1990s, one of the most brilliant people I have ever met in my life. Absolutely extraordinary. But that's a story for another time. But, the thing is, she puts into it. He says, yes, yes, we can make our, no, this is the 1940s. She says, yes, we can make our morning offering and just think, well, that's sufficient now. I turn my mind to God for three seconds in the morning, and now I'm good to go. Everything I do is sanctified because I've offered my day. And she says, so that to that person, even who thinks that they're being a good Catholic, the idea of them is that, well, I'm eating, and therefore it's sanctified. But they don't think about, well, how, how should my faith affect what I'm eating or how I'm eating? That doesn't enter into the mind. But you notice in the participation in that presence is what flows out. That's why you have that valediction at the end of the Mass. We call it the Mass because of that Latin phrase, ite missae est, go. It's a very bizarre Latin phrase because it kind of means, we don't even know exactly what its origin is, but ite is go. You leave this altar. Right? Go from the, with your faith, blessings from the forgiving altar of the Lord and receive the blessing. This is a commission at the end of this divine presence that we have just been in. Return to the world with God who is within you. Now who thinks like that? It's just like, oh my God, this has taken an hour and a half. i got to get out of here. That's what's being thought, but that's... What about the idea of being transformed before the Divine Presence and leaving to go out into the street to bring that reality because I am grace incarnate, last week's bulletin. That I am meant to bring that presence insofar as I can by living it. So it's a beautiful little thing to say, well, yes, I eat, you know, we say grace in the beginning. 
You know, we say blessing and that's it. I mean, who actually does that anymore anyway, you know, so. And grace at the end, oh, we've never done that, Abuna. Okay, well, we start and we finish with our minds elevated to God. But it's a beautiful point to say almost no one ever thinks about the fact is how should the faith transform the way I need it, or what I need it, or when I need it, or how much I need it. Instead, we think about law. You know, so if I gorge myself on this huge pile of food, I know that that's gluttony. So we, we're missing the point, and that's why the next section, that, that is the central Catholic aspect of why do the mysteries exist. They're not just Catholic ceremonies and Pentecostals do other Protestant ceremonies, and they're all the same. They are not the same at all. At all. And the fact that we, so many of us as Catholics can think in those terms just shows how residual our Catholic faith has become. You know? So basically, why do you go to the Catholic Church? Well, because that's what I was born in. If I had been Protestant, I wouldn't even question being Protestant. It's like, what? Well, no, but to understand what this apostolic faith is is totally different. That's why I say the tragic moment right now is that when Protestants come to understand the mysteries, that blows them out of the water because they have never thought that way. The tragedy is how many Catholics have never thought that way either so that when they do come to this realization, they they don't have anyone to talk to, so they become orthodox, huge numbers. You saw in the article in the Morning Sentinel, the Orthodox Church in Lewiston's going gangbusters. They have all kinds of converts. So what are we doing? No? That way, that was your question. Yeah, and I'm backing you up a second. <clears throat> we said grace every single meal, always, yeah. always. My mother would be at McDonald's with her friends having coffee, and yeah. she would say a prayer. The blessing. Oh, right. I have never heard a closing now that's grace. That's, okay. that, that's, that's a good point, because when we say grace, gracias, grace is thanksgiving. That's what we say at the end. Technically, what we do in the beginning is our blessing. We have a blessing before, and then we eat in thanksgiving, and then we have grace, which is, which is our thanksgiving at the end. Because I've taught at three Catholic schools, and it's always the same one. Oh, Lord, we thank thee, yeah. you know, at all, all the schools. That's at the beginning of lunch. That's, that's the blessing, we... yes. So Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts. Which we are about to receive. Yeah. But I have never heard a closing. Yeah. Is there a standard one like the one we just said? We give thee thanks, Almighty God, for all thy benefits, who livest and reignest forever and ever. I have never heard that in my life. And may the souls of the faithful departed, because we think of the dead, and may the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Wow, that's like kind that. of the nutshell. You just say, we thank you for everything we've received, including this food. And please show mercy upon our dead. Then we get up and wash dishes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of us have ever heard that. But you know what's funny is that this is how far we've come, because this article in 1946 is saying, well, we already do those. Do those, the two things. But how many of us actually think about that the Catholic faith in between them, what I'm eating, how I'm eating, and when I'm eating, how many of us think of the faith doing that? And that, you see, in the 40s and the 30s, they were already realizing, now this is a woman. This is a woman who in her youth, and up into college, I don't know if she went to Vassar, or, or she went to, I don't remember, she went to one of the, she's the, she's the North, she's an Easterner. And she converted by reading St. Thomas Aquinas as an atheistic woman at one of these, you know, established schools. Through St. Thomas Aquinas, it brought her towards the faith. I mean, obviously, subsequently, she had contact with Catholics that brought her actually in. But her initial, you know, shock was in reading St. Thomas Aquinas. And let's face it, it's a pretty rare person that usually works to that kind of intellectual level. But, you know, she, um, she's quite extraordinary. Anyways, I, I, I look forward to these books coming. I, I, I mean, I wish him well with it. And, and so, yes. I have a quick question for you. So what are your thoughts on not only saying, you know, saying the blessing over our food, but what about our pet's food? Well, I mean, you can. I mean, your pet is living in a different form of existence because they're not part of the kingdom. So, I mean, if you want to put it in the context, I used to have a Labrador. And I could not preach from the pulpit, because every place I've been, we've always had lots of kids and lots of young families. So I can hardly talk about discipline and virtue and everything that has to go with in the household and daily prayers, with, and then have my dog be a complete mess, right? Everyone's been to a house where the dog is completely untrained, right? So my Labrador had to sit 
as I put the food down and wait. So that was his version of grace. It was, it, was for, it was for him to be disciplined and he would sit until I, and then he would go for the food. Because I was not going to fight with the dog as I'm putting food down on the floor. You know, one, that was just for me and my sanity. Two is because he had to be disciplined. And so that's what we had. But saying as far as a blessing, we can bless anything that we use in the service of God. So you can bless the food if you want. That's fine. It doesn't do anything to your dog, but it brings you consciousness of the fact that everything that's being involved in your life should be given as thanks to God. So yes, I mean, it could be done, sure. Any other questions? All right. So that's why you'll see at the end that he says then the concluding word, biography, and then yet the whole appendix is all on the specific Maronite customs related to all these different mysteries. So it really goes into detail the different things that we do following that. So as I mentioned to you, as we enter into, we'll take our little break. I don't think there's any cookies or anything, but is there? Okay. we'll take a breather. So, but before we take the breather, is that well, it's one of the things I told you. So by by May of this year, we will have gone through all the epistles. First year was all the gospels. This year is all the epistles. And next fall. We're going to start with the liturgical year. Why do we do these things? Why is it the structure? Why do we have these things in this place? Precisely in the same thing that he's trying to do in this book form, that will become that will become the sermons following then to try to lead us through, beginning with the sign of the cross on how to make the sign of the cross. Both for Latins and for the East, it's supposed to be three fingers together, two fingers down, three fingers of the Trinity, two fingers for the divine nature and the human nature of our Lord. Even in the West, in the beginning of the 13th century, at the, I think the Fourth Lateran Council, they reminded everyone that this was the form that it was before. Look at this sword. Is that funny? funny these funny Can you little things. Which sword are you touching? What are you, what are you, what are you on your shoulder? Well, not, well yeah, even on the shoulders that I'm touching. The reason why the Orthodox are different is just because they're actually following the hand of the priest. That's why they go. That's why they go right to left, is they're following the priest making the sign of the cross it's, from the sanctuary. Mar but Maronite's different than the Roman, right? No. no. Yeah, it's the same. They go from left to right. They also, they also do that. Right? They yeah. also kiss their hand. Once you start talking about it, then you get confused. Yeah, no, we go left to right, and the, the Orthodox <laughs> go right I'm to left. Confused, like, I don't but the know. only reason why, and I think the Armenians also go left to right. And they do this. They do well, the Latins do that. So the Latins, the Latins, the Latins do that at the beginning of the gospel, yeah. 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 and, there should, and that's, that's a recognition of the mind and the word, yeah. the heart, which opens to the gospel, and that's very ancient. Tertullian talks about that in the 100s. Yeah. So the Latins are doing that practice in the Latin tradition, but we should be making a sign of the cross before we begin. All right, we'll take a little break. You can grab your caffeine. Yeah. Cool. That's why I say just read through the book. Because what we'll wind up doing is we'll take certain points out of each chapter and we'll just expand them by talking about some of the history or whatever else may be there. And then we'll also talk about them in conjunction with what we're trying to do here. I mentioned to you before, because this year coming up, for example, in the fall, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross takes place on a Saturday. So if, if you were to look, for example, in our parishes in Australia, they do the big vigil in the evening with a big illuminated cross, and they process with the cross outside. Um, in, when I was in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, they have a park, which in Ethiopian just means the place of the cross, because in, when they have the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross, it is like the whole city of Addis Ababa comes here, and they have this huge, enormous, two, three-story bonfire at the cross on top, lighting the whole thing on fire as part of this celebration that they do. And so because of the fact that this year um, it lands on a Saturday, it means that our vigil would be Friday evening. And I, you know, I'm looking to try to do, like we did with Palm Sunday last year, we did the proper entrance into the coming into the harbor. I'd like us to see do something. And even if we find a carpenter to do an illuminated cross that for those six weeks will be out on the front corner of the church that we light up. Mm. So 
figure out something. But those are the types of things I'm thinking about. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with the Latin traditions, but we are not Latin. And those who are in the pews, you know, people, some people have come and they said, well, so many things are changing. They're not, they may be changing from what you were doing, but they're not changing from what Maronites do. You know, so that's the important point, because the only future to St. Joseph's is to be a Maronite church. Right? The, Lebanese, the Lebanese ancestry, you know, begins to dwindle just by the fact of being in the country, right? You marry more French Canadian. So, and the first Lebanese club already closed. If we try to make St. Joseph's just a Lebanese club, it will also die, guaranteed. But if we make it a Maronite vibrant faith of apostolic endeavor, of apostolic work, we'll be fine. She'll be here forever. Okay. So, that's what we're looking at. So if you look at the beginning, this introduction that Father has, <coughs> this is kind of an overall view of what I'd like us to try to do. So this evening we looked basically at the, at the um, table of contents. And you'll notice, just as I, we mentioned that, um, it's on just the opposite page, number nine. You have Thanksgiving after a meal. Okay. You have the prayer before a meal, or the blessing, number eight. And number nine, the Thanksgiving after. And they are different from the Latin ones. So if you want to memorize something, you can always memorize that little prayer, too. And so, anyway. So we've looked at that this evening. What we're going to go on in the second part is we're going to look a little bit more at the fourth century, what the turmoils of the 300s are leading us up to. Well, really, by mid-300s, it's almost certain that's about the time when Marin would have been born. Say if he dies in his 60s or his 70s, he's born about 340, right? So 340, 350. We don't know exactly when. So we'll look a little bit more at the century of the 300s because it's the direct, there is no break. Even the French Revolution or the American Revolution are not breaks. They are as much effects of things that have gone before them as of what they actually spin off in the future. There are moments in which historical events become more intense and they may cause bigger explosions, but they are always going to be the result of something else happening before them. Nothing happens in a vacuum. That's why if you read the bulletin last week, I talk about this, this excessive self-centered individualism that we're living through now it has been growing over the last 400 years. It didn't just happen after World War II. This is something which has gone deeper and deeper and deeper, and deeper to the point where it transformed the Christian message. So to give you, I've mentioned from the pulpit before, but one of the classic things to understand is up until the 18th century, the parable of the Good Samaritan was always understood as being <coughs> our Lord, giving us a parable about himself. We never tried to interpret it as a social activity to make sure you help people who are homeless and living under the bridge. That was never part of what that parable meant. But it's what we did. It's why if you see any orthodox icon of the Good Samaritan, he will look like Jesus. He will have a beard and a halo and he will be Jesus, picking up the man off the side of the road because it's not a story of the social gospel as we call it, it's a story of redemption. Right? And what it's telling you is that the man who was waylaid by robbers are the children of Adam. That's why we don't know, is he a Jew, is he a Samaritan, what is he? We don't know. And it doesn't matter because it's not part of the story. But what he's also telling you in the parable is that the law of Moses is done. The law of Moses walked past the man. Fulfilling the Mosaic law. Because they're not allowed to have contact with corpses. They're doing exactly what Moses obliged them to do. And they walk past <coughs> wounded humanity. Until the cast-off, the half-breed, the scorn, the despised Samaritan comes along. That is the Messiah. Totally different interpretation of this. Because the fathers of the church and everybody up until the 18th century understood no one can do that. No one is going to sacrifice themselves in that manner. But the idea was is that's the main purpose of the parable. But in beginning to spin Christianity, and in the 18th century is the same time of the French Revolution. 
You have immediate spin, for example, on priesthood. What is priesthood? Priesthood is not the intercession of the divine mysteries or of St. Paul, of the one who is the ambassador of God to proclaim the word and to be a steward of the mysteries of God. That goes in the background. Because in the French Revolution, you have to justify your existence. But being at the altar, is, that's not important. And so that's why they went around smashing convents and monasteries, breaking cloisters. We freed you, sisters, you can go now. And it's like, well, the cloister isn't locking them in. It's locking you out. You don't understand this at all. But you're parasites. You don't do anything. Yeah, no, these women just spend eight hours a day, at least, in prayer and adoration because we are off working in a filing clerk job, distracted by other stuff. They are the reason why the world exists generation after generation. So, but after the French Revolution, you had to justify your prayer life. You had to justify. So that all of a sudden it shifted from being that apostolic work of the divine mysteries and presence and transformation of the kingdom to now I have to justify because I founded a hospital or I've opened a homeless shelter. Now there's nothing wrong with those things. But you will notice prior to the 18th century, those are always done by lay people. St. Alexis or St. Saint, uh, Camillus de Lellis. These are all lay movements to open up hospitals to do these works of charity, and they're all brilliant. The Ursuline, schooling, education, taking care of orphans, doing all the corporal works of mercy, but it was never considered part of the priesthood. Not that priests weren't involved, but it was because the priest is at the altar. Totally different vision. Totally different vision. And so, but it begins to shift in those 1700s. So, you know, we are the descendants. This has been going on for a long time. And so this whole vision of what is at the depth of it, you know, has a great importance. And so that's why what we'll look at then in the third place is I'm hoping maybe next week I will bring. So today we're going to do a little more on this fourth century. But next week what I'd like to do is to bring and start looking at the Patriarch's encyclical from last Lent. I didn't put it out because they didn't send it to us till after Easter because you got translated from Arabic. So by the time they translated it and sent it to us, and I'm not going to put this out in Easter. It's on, it's on penance and fasting. The Patriarch reiterates all of our fasting teachings. So, you know, last week it was wonderful because we had one of our actual immigrants come and she's in the sack, and she says, this is really interesting. She says, you know, back in Lebanon, we were eating fish and everything during Lent. I said, I know, I know. She said, I, you know, and I, but I saw, I saw the, you know, the things that you were in the book. And I said, well, yeah, but you, it's the same thing in the Mar Maronite voice. You saw, you know, yeah, I saw that. And she was like, you know, wow, I never knew that this kind of vegan tradition in the East. And nobody even used the word vegan. It says, you abstain from all those things. But the patriarch does that last year. You know, that's why I'm just you know, dropping these bombs out there. You know, things are changing. Things don't change. It's just a reiteration of what our patrimony is. And the more that we understand the richness behind it, the more we are going to be a beacon and a light in central Maine. And so next week, maybe, because we are at the beginning of Lent now, I'll bring some of the copies of the encyclical, and we'll go through some of them. You know, we'll point out some of the things. We won't read it together, but we'll go through again, like usual, and point out some of the, the details. It's on the website. Yeah, and it's, yeah. since last year, it's been, linked, it's been linked to the website. You can go ahead and read it. But next week, we'll talk a little bit about it, hopefully. Okay? So that's part of what we'd like to do in these next, in the next two months, or three months, March, April, 10, yeah, whatever, 10 weeks. And then, um, and then we'll start going through this book, back and forth, the history. And then um, there's a point five here that I put down because I'm thinking I might do one class just on the classic canons of the church, on some of the canons. Because now we, we, we blow trumpets and we say we have zero tolerance of the abuse of, the, of people within the church by the clergy. Church has always had zero tolerance. The canons have always existed. They just haven't been implemented. And that's why everyone's in a rage, especially if you know the canons, because if it hasn't been a problem. The church has always had these directives. They just haven't been implemented. You know? 
And I bring it up because, as far as I can see, the synod in Rome was just a complete dud. It didn't bring out anything. You know? And we, these things need to be spoken of openly because there is a real... That's why I've left the intercession prayer in the bulletin. We are going to keep praying this. And so, because if they don't fix it, nobody can. That's just the way it works. Until you get bishops into the mode of reform and the priests in the reform of uh, in the mode of reform movement, nothing happens in the Church of God. The laity can't fix it because they're not in charge. If that's not patriarchal, that's not you know power grabs. That's just the way God set it up. And so, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite walk right by the guy. He's going to die. That's it. And so, I think maybe, but I have to open up some of my boxes to get my old canon law books out. So, but we might, we might do that. Just to, it's not, not to do a lot, but just to go through a few of the canons to show that not only... I, well, it actually, who was at that Saturday sermon? Hang them up by their thumbs and flog them. Right. I've never heard anything like that before in my life. I wasn't there. I'm going to go. <laughs> it was a real moment of grace. I mean, it really was. The canons um, according to the Roman Rite? Yes, but the in the East, they also right? exist in the Eastern Rites, too. Now, the Eastern has never had a code. Well, we'll talk about that in that class. We've never had a singular book with law in it. Okay. That only exists from 1917. <laughs> Before that, you had a library. And when you were a jurist, you had to know basically this whole library and then interpretation. Is this from a synod? Is this an apostolic decision? Is this a local synod? Is this a national? Is this an ecumenical council? And know how to work the hierarchy of the values of these different directives and then interpret accordingly, along with all the principles. And St. Pius X at the beginning of the 20th century simplified all of that and put it into one book. That's why we talk about the code now. And we never had a code. Up until the 20th century, it was known as the body of canon law. Now it's known as the code of canon law. And it's much more easily done, but there's a lot of controversy around it, and there was in 1917. Okay, So we may come back to it, because I want you to understand that the church is not discovering to be wise. The church has been wise for her entire history. All you got to do is read the Acts of the Apostles with them coming up with practical decisions on what to do with non-Jewish converts in the very beginning. Okay? There have always been directives. There have always been canons. There have always been decisions that have come up. So I'm thinking that during the next couple of months we might do one of the classes. We'll just be on some of these. In fact, it may be just part of a canon, part of a class, because they don't really require it. It's just a number, a few of the canons. But they were canons that, that give mandatory punishments for things that are done by priests. By anyone, including bishops. We always talk about priests and bishops as if somehow bishops aren't priests. They're part, you know, the bishops need to do something about their priests. Well, excuse me, the bishops are priests too. They just, you know, they just have an administrative post, you know. They're just as, you know, they, their mass doesn't have any more Jesus in it than anybody else's mass. It's just, you know, the Pope doesn't have Jesus any more in St. Peter's than you have here. Or that the Irish had offering on some rock in a field under British persecution. That's an important point. They make this way, this huge chasm. It's actually one of the reasons why I was quite happy to come to an Eastern church also, is because there is not the chasm between the bishop and the faithful. It's not just Bishop Gregory, it's just, that's just the Eastern way. Because the Easterners don't see themselves as being, you know, on this Himalaya, and then you've got the clergy and the people. You know. That's part of that imperial Latin vision. You know, the Maronites never wore mitres either. That's from the Crusades. I mean, their head covering was the monastic court. That's all, I just put it up. <laughs> And that's why, as we talk about the earlier parts of the, uh, we'll talk about the Irish church, because I, in knowing the history, I, I am sure that the Maronites and the uh, Irish church in the 500s and the 600s were very similar events, very similar ways of organizing ecclesiastically, church-wise. But, on this point, because if you just follow press releases and 
uh, news articles, you have the impression that now the bishops are beginning to figure out what to do with this. And it's like, no, this isn't new. None of this is new. You know, this is all, you know, human nature is what human nature is. And this is an abuse of power. You know, there's always been this question. Trevin Sykes, we've got documentation now, you know, the documentary that came out on HBO with, with uh, what is it, Michael Jackson, you know. So this is a question of power, people who have power and people who don't have power, you know. But also you need to make the other distinctions that are coming in. This isn't all about children, you know. So there is an aspect of homosexuality in this too, and that also needs to be discussed. You know, it's why there have been canons about homosexuals in the clergy. It's not to be, you know, persecuting any kind of people. It's just to say, look, some of these are in, they're not, they're not, they don't fit together, okay? So does canon just mean law or rule? What canon, canon in Greek means a measure. So the, the canons then, when you give them, these are directives because they're giving us ways to do things, measures. So it's just a directive. Yeah, it's, it's the way, yeah, but we, you know, we'll use the word law for it. They're, they're just as, they're just as mandatory as any other laws, but they're the terms which are used for the ecclesiastical. Okay. All right, so that's kind of an overview of the trial we might do over these next, uh, these next seven weeks or whatever, it's going to be 10 weeks. All right, what I'm going to do is let's go back then to um, the fourth cent, the 300s. And the reason why I want to go back over them, it's where, it's where we left off, because we left off with the Diocletian persecution, this great eruption trying to, um, trying to basically exterminate Christianity. We mentioned part of the problem is, is that, well, as far as for their concern was, is that in the Western world, in what's now France and in Britain, this was never really implemented. And we mentioned about, because you have one of the generals out there, one of the Caesars, under this division of how the empire was being divided up, is that uh, Constance Chloris, Constantine's father, you know, have been married to Helen. And this is what we talked, we left off with that, if you remember in the fall, is that the great importance, I mean, this woman is so central on what she does in influencing her first husband, though he's a pagan, and then, of course, subsequently her son, though he's also a pagan. Constance Chloris worshipped the sun. But Helen was, had to have been such a dynamic individual, not dynamic in getting things done, by dynamic in the sense of radiating strength and conviction. That's what's important. We talk about dynamism, you know, and power as if it's just running around doing stuff all the time. Dynamism, dynamis in Greek, means power. And it's the depth of character. You don't, we don't, other than Helen going to the Holy Lands and having the excavations done and bringing back the relics of the Passion, and the things that she did in Rome in her later life, we don't know anything she did when she was younger. But this woman had to be of profound depth and radiance because of what she did in influencing the men around her. They clearly, clearly were touched and transformed by her. If we had more Helens in the world, the world would look different. And we left off, if you recall, in the fall, talking about it in the 200s. Helen is just an example of what was happening in Christianity anyway. You remember? We talked about For the Romans in that, the infanticide of children was not a big deal for them. You know? They wouldn't be outraged over the governor of Virginia saying, well, if the abortion is botched up, we'll put the baby off to the side and discuss with the parents if we're going to do any kind of medical treatment or just let it die. You remember, that was the interview done, I don't know, a month ago or two months ago. For the Romans, that was just the way things were done. And the last thing they wanted was, you know, more than a girl or two, you know. So the girls were oftentimes just killed off. Right? They were exposed. Or they, what they would do is, in some cases, in the exposing of them, they would just stuff the baby's mouth with cinders so that you couldn't hear the crying, and then just put it out to be exposed in the countryside. Doubtless coyotes eat it or something, you know, so. But that's the way the Romans looked at these things. We're returning to that pagan vision. That's, I'm, you know, we know that. We see that. We see this way of living. Right? They talk about China having the whole problem. Now they have a whole generation of little emperors because they decided only to have boys because they could only have one child. So now you have an entire civilization of just males who have no one to marry. Right? And who were spoiled in many cases because it's your only child. And it's the only child the law allowed you to have, right? So 
But, and the pagans have always done that, you know. And so, what was happening with the Christians, of course, is Christians didn't kill their babies. And so, by force of events, by adult conversions, and simply by having Catholic families, you had more Catholic women in the world by the 200s. Christian women who had their babies at home and who were teaching them at home and teaching them what? The Gospel. Read St. Augustine's book, The Confessions. He talks about drinking in the name of Christ along with his mother's milk. Though he's never baptized as a child. That's a different Mediterranean problem in the 300s. This is the generation and the century that we want to talk about. But he always, for the rest of his life, the rest of his young adult life, is haunted because things don't have value if they don't have the name of Christ in them. And he says this even though he becomes a Manichaean, this very, very strange, eastern, bizarre religion, which is also coming back. Every version of paganism, heresy, lives with us and surging around us all over the place. And so... That's why the story of Helen, as beautiful as it is, is not unique. And that's why you arrive at the fact that in the late 200s, it's estimated, about the year 300, it's estimated that probably at this point already about 10% of the population is Christian within the empire. In some places, much heavier. I mean, that's the average for the whole empire. Some places, it's much heavier. For example, in Egypt, a huge proportion of the population was Christian. They lost per capita the most, num the greatest number of people during the Diocletian persecution. But we want to come back to these three hundreds to understand that you know we have all been imbibed, we have all been taught with this idea that progress just goes generation to generation, and we just keep getting better. And now we're like, oh, well, maybe our kids aren't going to have better up a better paying job than we had, we boomers. Oh gosh. As if that has never happened before in the world. And so it's important to understand that when we do these 300s, yes, we have Constantine comes to the throne. And it will be a mere contrast, if you want, to what Helen does in her generation. Because in the 300s, of course, now this family is in charge. Constantine. And he legalizes, and he does it. He does not make Christianity the religion of the empire. He only gives religious freedom to everyone. I mean, the first time that we know of in the entire history of the world that we've ever had say to a community of people, worship whatever you want. Because the understanding of a community was, well, it's based on, you know, a, an understanding of the divine. And to say, well, take a pick was pretty revolutionary. And so with Constantine, well, that's what takes place in the year 313. All right? So, and then he begins, and that's what we left off with in October, was then he begins the whole aspect of judicial inquiry. The people in the last 25 years, whose houses were destroyed because they had a chapel in them? You had people who lost their own property because you're having mass in a room of your house. So, you can't have mass, it's illegal Christianity, your house is confiscated. You lost your property, you're now homeless. Now some of these people died. Now this is the great story in the 300s of Saint Basil, Saint Gregory of Nyssa, Saint Macrina, this family, and Saint Peter. This family of siblings, parents are saints you know, St. Macrina the Senior, I think that's the mother, St. Basil the Senior, and those people, six, all canonized, recognized saints, the whole family. We haven't seen something like that until you get to the Martins in the 19th century, you know. But what happened is the grandparents, these people were landed people in Anatolia, in Cappadocia. They had lands, they had money, they had wealth. And they knew that if they were arrested, they may apostatize because they lived. The grandparents lived during the persecutions of Diocletian. So what did they do? They left everything behind. 
and this young couple went to the mountains and the forested area of the Black Sea to live in hiding. No more servants, no more big houses. They left everything for the sake of the faith because they didn't know that if they were thrown in prison and subjected to torture, what they'd actually wind up doing, which is a very wise and, and you know, intelligent thing. You know, we'd all think we'd like to be on a holy card someday and that we just would be a martyr, you know. But all you got to do is read some of these things that they were done to them and torturing them. Oh, for heaven's sakes, much closer to us, you just have to read about Cardinal Mishenti during that whole period of time you know, in Eastern Europe. So, but for me that story, it shows that because of the, because nothing is unconnected, our apostate children today are apostates because of what has gone on in the generations before them. The same way the fidelity of this young couple, leaving everything and fleeing off into the forest of the Black Sea, that fidelity gives them saints in the next generation, and their grandchildren rank as some of the greatest ecclesiastical writers that the Christian church has ever known. Now we talk about the Cappadocians, you know, the four of them, St. Basil, St. Gregory of Nazienda, St. Gregory of Nyssa. And these individuals, two of them are the grandchildren of a young couple who fled in the early 300s to preserve their faith. Father, could you talk a little more about what an apostate is? Because I, I know that... Uh, so the apostate, when we use the term apostate... Apostle is so close to apostate. Uh, apostate, all right? So, that's a good question. Because I've heard you use that many times. Right. And so, it's actually anti, right? Or, so, so, it comes from apostasis, apo. So apo is like a way. Like we talk about in, in Latin, object. Yatari is to throw something, and ob is in, in front of. So objectare, objectum, is what is thrown in front of you, in your place. It's where we get the word observation, like in scientific observation. Servare in Latin means to keep something. Ob is in front. So ob servare literally means to keep something continually in front of you. You watch it. So stasis is the Greek word for standing. Or placement. Or standing. So that's why words like ecstasis, ecstasy, it literally means to stand outside yourself. Ecstasis, to be drawn outside. Apostasis means to be, separate, to be standing away. <coughs> So apostasis is a Greek word for divorce. You separate yourself from. So the church uses this Greek term. They just took the term culturally. And it refers, it refers technically to the individual who repudiates their religion. Okay? That they've repudiated their religion. It doesn't mean that you have to stand on a bridge someplace and shout, I hate Jesus. <laughs> and I renounce my religion, though that's what it, it, it's kind of, in a sense, when it comes to the canons now, it's like, well, what do you determine to be an apostate? Well, because of the Germans, always the Germans, um, you, have to, you have to renounce your religion by writing now, for the sake of the canons, since a decision, I think, in 1997 or something. But Father, what, the reason I said it was because it's a divorce. You renounce some people became a, apostate without really well, that's knowing That's what I was it. getting to. Yeah. That can, it doesn't mean that you're standing on a bridge shouting this. It can be, for example, under Diocletian, first it began with the clergy. Well, first it actually began in the administration and in the military. Then it began with the clergy. Knock out the teachers. Hand over the scriptures. Hand over the books. Hand over the vessels. <coughs> then it began everybody. And everybody was required by law throughout the Roman Empire to honor the gods. The gods have given us the empire. The empire is not doing well because you are not faithful to the gods. If the gods gave us Rome and you're not faithful, doubtless we are in trouble. And therefore, what Christianity was looked upon as being is something treasonous. 
And so what they required of everyone to do is you had to go to the temples and you had to participate personally in the ceremonies. That's the offering of incense. You had to go to the altar and offer incense. You know, this was done all the time. We think we have too much incense here, but hey, you know, when you came into the Senate chamber in Rome, the Senate, the Curia, in, in the Roman Forum, there was a statue of victory standing there, Nike in Greek, the Victoria. And when, when the senators would come in, they would put incense onto this constantly burning altar in front of her to throw it in there. That statue wasn't gotten rid of until the end of the fourth century. St. Ambrose is making petitions to the government, get rid of this thing in the Senate chamber. Of course, a lot of the pagans were like, mm -hmm, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't. So everyone was required, and you got what was called a libellus, a certificate that said you participated in the ceremony. And if you went, and you did this ceremony recognizing the gods, that was apostasy. That because you showed formally that you had adhered to a false divinity and therefore you repudiated Jesus Christ. That's an example. This is why our Lord told us very clearly in the gospel, you know, when you can flee to the mountains, you can hide. You don't have to stand there and just be dragged off to prison. If you know something is going to happen, you can take off to the forest of the Black Sea. You know? And this family only becomes a confirmation of that wisdom of the gospel that our Lord had taught 300 years before by the fact that it just flourished in holiness. So the reason why I bring them up is, well, then why in the, the generation of the grandchildren, why are they these huge landowners? They're, they're very wealthy. Because under, under Constantine, he had, throughout the empire, judicial inquiries done everywhere to make restitution of unjustice, unjust possession of properties during the unjust persecutions against the Christians. This is why St. John Lateran, which is actually a cathedral of Rome, not St. Peter's, belongs to the church. The Lateran was a palace that belonged personally to the emperor. He gave this whole property over to the Bishop of Rome as an act of restitution. In fact, they gave them a couple palaces. Gave them buildings and the lands that they were on. His mother, Helen, gave her house. Her house is now known as Holy Cross in Jerusalem. In fact, it's down the street from the ladder. You walk, they're part of the procession routes for Rome. And that's where she brought all the relics back from the excavations. And they're in her old house, right? which is now a Cistercian monastery and one of the seven major basilicas of Rome. You know, basilica just refers to the fact that this is the king's building. That's all it refers to, which may mean it's an administrative building, or in this case, it's a private residence. So that's why these things were being restored. Places like St. Peter's, Constantine had it built as an act of reparation for the slaughtering of St. Peter. He's the one that had them mow a million cubic yards of dirt. There is no Vatican Hill left because they leveled it so they could build the first church right on top of this cemetery that used to be next to the stadium. All right? Rome is an absolutely magnificent... I mean, just, you can't move two feet without going, oh, wait a minute, look at this. Oh, oh no, wait, this is... Because it just, it's layered and it's everywhere. So what Constantine, and the reason why we're going into detail is because Constantine's family is still a family, right? And when you're newly baptized, well, you know, the religion has to sink in. It takes generations for the faith really to become, what should we say? Cemented. Penetrating within a culture. You know, when Clovis died, Clovis, you know, Clovis, he didn't die with a rosary in his hands. Clovis had kind of these quasi-pagan ceremonies. He hadn't even been baptized. He just had been baptized a few years before. Now his wife had been, they'd been Catholics for a while, but that's a different, you know, at the end of the 400s. Now, when Constantine and his family, well, they continue doing all the same thing that political families do, right? Which is kill each other. And the reason why we brought up the family of 
St. Gregory Nazianzus and St. Basil and the rest of them is because Constantine's family is going to reflect an opposite thing. And what it is is that, remember, Constantinople was built, it opened in the year 330. Constantine died shortly after that. Okay? And he's baptized like six weeks before he actually dies. He goes to Palestine, he goes to the Holy Lands to be baptized there. Okay? And he dies, times it really well, and is baptized within the two months before he actually dies. All right? Until that time, he's always been officially a pagan and still carrying the pagan title of Pontifex Maximus. He's still been the chief administrator of all the pagan cults of the empire. And that's why it's important to understand what he's doing is a question of justice, restoring property, having people released from prison. That's why we've told you at the Council of Nicaea in 325, remember we told you that there were a number of the bishops who showed up, who hobbled and who were half-blinded because they had been in prison under Diocletian. They had been condemned to slavery. So what happens now in the next generation is this battle between, I mean, Constantine also has, you know, he, he has one of his wives put to death. And, and, you know. In the East, we recognize Constantine and Helen as equal to the apostles. The Latin church has never canonized in that sense Constantine. He went through a number of women. There's things he did during his life. Um, but it's true, he did that during his pagan phase. I mean, his baptism is weeks before he dies. And so he's always recognized as Constantine the Great because of what he actually accomplishes, not just simply for the sake of the gospel spreading, but also just out of justice. Right? But, be that as it may, political families being political families, right? there's a lot of murders that take place in the next 20, 30 years. And that's why, by the time we reach the mid-300s, that's why I preface this whole thing, but we always talk about, like, history, like, all is necessarily always goes forward. It doesn't go forward. It goes upon whatever the previous generations have been making. We are living in a world which, intellectually, is practically insane, because for 400 years we've just been reworking, you know, what is human nature? What is, what is the purpose of human life, you know? And simultaneously, for the last 150 years, we're telling everyone, well, you're nothing than a hairless monkey. But you have to be nice, and you can't say nasty words about other people. Well, why not? If I'm just an animal. I mean, it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense that we teach people, you are just a product of random, chance, evolutionary processes, and you are nothing different than an animal, except you have this funny thing called consciousness. And you have to be nice. Well, if I'm just an animal, why do I have to be nice? It doesn't make any sense. So you have this conflict that's going on. And this whole shift. It's one of the reasons why I'm going to develop this a bit in the bulletins as we go on over the weeks. Because, you remember we talked about the mysteries are from what flows Christian morality. If you don't have the mysteries, you can hang on to things for a while. But we have been doing nothing but just going ptum, 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 over the last four or five centuries. We just keep moving further and further away from a Christian world. That's why the Christians who still exist have to radically rework the way they think. And I've said this numerous times, because if we are not consciously working at the way that we think to be in conformity with the gospel, then we are not thinking as Christians goes back to the, the, the lady who said, well, you can do your morning offering, say grace before meals, but a few people would think about, well, how does my faith change about what I eat, how I eat, when I eat? We don't think in those terms. But those are the things, and that's why this group of lay people started producing this journal, which is profound intellectual integrity. On the flip side then, because it isn't just simply, and that's why, and we'll talk about this probably next week, not this coming Sunday, but maybe the Sunday after in the bulletin, it's why we have to see ourselves as not being an end product. That is very arrogant. In the 19th century, you know, you have one of the greatest acts of modern arrogance in the world, in the, the world parliament, or the, what do we call it, in the Columbia Exposition 1893 in Chicago. Because the Wasp of America said, that's it, we have lights, we have purified waters, we have sanitation, not like those despicable Italians who still you know, pee, in the, pee in the streets. 
we have reached this pinnacle of civilization in 1893. The big Columbia exhibition for 500 years of the discovery of America. There is such an arrogance in the modern world that somehow everyone before us, because they didn't have indoor plumbing, was somehow deficient. We talk about the dark ages, we talk about all these different things, as if somehow we are the end product of all of these brute, ignorant people. This is insane. This is not a normal way of thinking. And it is a complete impious act to reject your ancestors who got you here in the first place. But that's why I'm saying is that we have to see this in a larger vision. And I'll use a quotation later in the, in the bulletin on, um, by Reinhold Niebuhr, who was a Protestant. And he talks about the fact is that the work that we accomplish here is not in our generation. And therefore it has to be done with faith. We have to believe that there's continuity after us. You know? I mean, I've done a lot of stomping at St. Joseph's for almost the last two years now. People are like, oh, you sound pretty negative. I'm not sounding negative. I want you to understand where you were when I found you, to be realistic, and then have that faith, hope, and charity, which sees the future and is building something for 2130 and your great, 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 great grandchildren or whatever, or whoever else comes to you. There has always been ups and downs. And so this idea of continuity. So that's why when you look at Constantine's family, you have these people murdered, he has a great nephew called Julianus, Julian. Now Julian to this day is known as Julian the Apostate. You have Constantine the Great, and then in the middle of the century, after some other people come in, He's finally succeeded by his great nephew, Julian. Julian was baptized as a child. At that point, everyone's being baptized. And he watched growing up in the palace, his uncles murder each other. And live in this family. Which is why Julian, at the age of 18, apostatizes. He, renoun he renounces Christianity. I've talked to you about uh, a Benedictine author in the 20th century. His name is Giuseppe Ricciotti. He wrote a book just on Julian the Apostate. It is actually a couple, it's, it's not technically a second volume, but it's a volume that goes with his other book called The Age of the Martyrs on the Diocletian Persecution. They are excellent. They are excellent. If you can find them, find them, buy them, read them, they are excellent. But Julian the Apostate, because he shows that Julian is not a black and white character. Julian is, as a young man, living in a very dysfunctional family, you know, with high stakes, you know. To govern the entire, you know, world, that's not too bad. King of the world, all the civilized world, the Mediterranean basin, that's what's at stake. So his uncles are killing each other. So when he finally becomes, when he's being educated, and his tutors are bishops, his tutors are priests. And by the time he reaches 18, he's, he's tired of all of this. And at 18, when he comes into his majority, he repudiates Christianity explicitly. Well, we know explicitly later on, but he still plays the Christian facade in order to become emperor, to stay in good graces with what's going on. But we know that he was involved with theurgy, this kind of mystical paganism, magical stuff, right? But he's also been educated his whole life by Christian priests, right? For the most part, those are his tutors. So he has this idea of paganism, that pagan priests should be studious, should not be going to the stadiums or the theaters. And when he becomes emperor, he tries to create all of these laws to restore paganism and to persecute Christianity. Remember, it hasn't been, it's never been the official Religion. That's not going to happen until another 30 years. So what Julian winds up doing is things like laws being passed that the gods have given us the empire. The gods give us Rome. Therefore, someone who doesn't recognize that should not be part, doesn't recognize our patrimony, should not be part of this. And therefore, you had laws against Christians being teachers. You couldn't teach. So now you had to make a decision either to just be jobless for the rest of your life or apostatize. And that's where you have St. Cassian. That's the generation of St. Cassian. St. Cassian, Cassianus, was a teacher. And his condemnation to death 
was to have his schoolboys his school kill him with their steel styluses, the things you scrape into the tablets you have with the wax, so you can write in the wax, and then you'd go home and you'd memorize all your lessons, and then you'd melt the wax down, you'd have a clean surface for tomorrow. There were these little steel pens that you would write with. That's what these middle school boys killed him. That was his condemnation, to be killed by a bunch of 14-year-olds. So, Father, this is the, the context of the, of the culture when Marin comes into the picture. And it becomes yeah, so at this point, when Julian's doing this, this is about the time when Marin's being born. Right. And so, the reason why we're bringing it up is to understand that things don't always go forward unless in your generation you make... Now, doubtless the uncles who were murdering each other didn't think, well, you know, Junior over here, the kid, was 8 or 10, that he's going to grow up to try to be something that's going to be rather monstrous. No. Oh, you just think, I want to be king. <laughs> so I kill my brother, you know. Because I think about myself. And that's why when we do work through this, we have a larger vision that we have to have. So when we finish, remember we, last time we also talked about the Council of Nicaea was in 325. We did that. Did we hand this up? Listing the council. Yes. Yes. Okay. We have that. Okay. Good. So I just wanted to finish off then with Julian, because Julian's apostasy is your last official persecution. He's only emperor for three years. It does not. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of good number of people who die. But even the pagans make fun of him in the sense that, like when he tells the pagan priest. Don't go to the stadiums. And they're like, well, why not? You know, because he's using his vision of what the Catholic priests were like. And they weren't going to the stadiums. They weren't going to the theater. But those things were obscene in the Roman Empire, like a lot of the theater that we have today. You know, they just weren't there. And he wanted them studious. Studious of what? You don't. There's no scriptures for paganism. What do you want us to do? And so, no, it's, that didn't make any sense. So even when Julian does this, you can tell how rooted Christianity is becoming already by the middle of the 300s. Okay? So this is the moment in which Marin, young Marin, is born into the world in Syria. All right? So this is also then when the whole ascetic movements begin in the mid-300s. Because once the persecutions are done, remember, you have to remember that how, for us it's impossible to imagine. But to have been a Christian for the first 300 years of the church meant you're always waiting to be arrested, to have your property confiscated, to be killed, to be driven into exile. That's all. That, to be Christian, that's what it meant. That all could always happen to you. It wasn't always happening, but it could always happen. So when you, that's why the ascetic movement takes place. Part of the reason is that in the 300s, the idea is, well, now what? Now we're just going to be wimps? Because now it's legal and everything? And so you have these people like, no, we can do more of this. We can live those teachings of the gospel to its Fullness. You leave behind father, mother, brother, sister, lands for my sake. And they go out into the deserts. They go out into the deserts because that's the place where the baptismal waters have not consecrated. It's the place where the devil resides. That's why they go out. They don't go out because it's pretty and there's beautiful sunsets in the western Nile. They go there because it's the place that is outside the kingdom. They go there to wage combat. That's why when you read the Fathers, you always have things about visions of devils and temptations and all this, because that's what you went out for, was to roll up your sleeves and to duke it out for the areas that were still out in darkness and not in the kingdom. So that's part of what's taking place that Marin is also born into. And I remember we also talked in the last fall about the Benai Kyomo, the sons of the covenant, the Benai Kyomo. That aspect too. This is happening at the same. Actually, that's even more ancient because that's even in the 100s already in the ancient Syriac church that we talked about. All right, and that's why when Julian dies, he dies on a campaign against the Persians. But Julian 
is also the person, the last person, to attempt to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Now, you may witness the next attempt to rebuild because, boy, especially with Trump, we're moving full force here to get Israel with all the power, closing down the Palestinians, moving their office, doing you heard that the last couple of days, right? <coughs> There's no longer even, even, a, even a facade of having an ambassador with the Palestinian group. But when Julian goes to have them build a temple, remember our Lord talks about it, it's destruction stone upon a stone. He says, when they started building, it's talked about by the contemporaries, when he started having the foundation laid to build the temple, fire came from the foundations. We don't know what this is supposed to mean. It destroyed the construction site, and nobody did it because Julian died. And nobody really cared after that. And so it was never done. But that was the last attempt about the year 360. And it is said, you know, when he was 18, what Julian did is Julian took a shell during one of these pagan ceremonies. And he took this shell and he scratched his face, his forehead, signifying his repudiation of the baptismal waters. And when he died in Persia on campaign, he's only like 35 years old. When he dies on, in campaign against the Persians, he's said to have taken the blood from his wound and to throw it into the air and say, Nazarene, you've conquered. Hmm. Now, that's the story behind Julian the Apostate. The generation into which almost certainly either Marin is a little boy or is born into. Any questions? All right. We're good till next week.